Bengaluru International Film Festival. We are now showing a documentary called Peace Notes, which was directed by Miss Maya Chandra and Akil Ji Kumar. The documentary was made in English language and was released in the year 2023. We are extremely fortunate to have Miss Maya Chandra and Mr. Akil S. Kumar here with us today. I would like to welcome them to the stage and say a few words about the documentary. Good evening. I'd like to introduce my team. This is Akhil, Naveen, Vishnu, Darshan. Please come, because every film made is an effort of a team. And the team is highly responsible for all of us being here today. Welcome you all, and thank you for gracing this occasion. I'd like all of you to see the film, and then we will have an introduction. Thank you all. This is Akhil, Naveen, Darshan, Vishnu, Namaste. Team Maya. Thank you. Mr. Vidya Shankar, the artistic director of our film festival, to present the directors with a memento. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, sir, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. The documentary is 20 minutes, peace notes in English. Following the documentary is a panel discussion, diplomacy through music, Participants will be uh, Dr. Indira Chandrasekhar, Dr. Janavi Palki, and Mrs. Nirupama Menon Rao, and Mr. Sudhakar Rao. Please enjoy the show and the panel discussion after that. Thank you. So can you go, pa, 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 for now. Let's try that, yeah? We believe in the power of music to build peace. Anyone, you don't even need to be a musician. Anyone can be plucked into the language of music. The first language we speak together is music. I've never seen that before, so it was shocking, actually. For them, they say that music is haram and you don't have right to listen or to play music. This is an idea that is unstoppable. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nirbhuma and Sudhakar Rao. Uh, all of you know music plays a very important uh, component of cinema. Uh, in the process, we also talk about music every time. Every year we talk about cinematography, we talk about editing, we talk about... Uh, today we had a discussion on production design, artwork in cinema, and everything. I mean, uh, every aspect of cinema we discuss. Today, in fact, the ent entire afternoon we are talk discussing about music in cinema. In fact, it is not just a coincidence that when we are talking about orchestra and symphonies, it, it is India in the film music that actually pioneered the concept of orchestration in Indian music. Earlier it was only Indian music had accompaniments, whereas today we have orchestrations, we have symphonies. Therefore, we are trying to build this kind of relationships between a diplomacy through cinema we are trying, and Madam has created a new organization here for diplomacy through music. Thank you, Madam, for this initiative. Thank you, sir, for this initiative. Now we are going to have a discussion with them here on the platform. Please do come. Uh, let me get started. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. That was really just the most uh, inspiring and wonderful experience to see the journey of the South Asian Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Sudhakar Rao, thank you also, both of you. Um, I think seeing it together, I must compliment Maya for making such a fine film because seeing it together like that um, as a sort of an evolution but a uh, continued inspiration, I think it, it was really very moving moving, really deeply moving, and to see all the musicians come together and their joy in the experience was, was beautiful. I'm sure there were lots of blips and problems and all kinds of things, but none of that, the, is what shines through is their um, sort of 
enjoyment, commitment to the music, to being part of an orchestra together. So um, I have lots of things that I'd like to say, but I think the most important thing is to hear from Ambassador Rao first off. And so um, I wanted to make this comment that, you know, it's so interesting that someone like you, who's devoted her professional career to building bridges between nations, to finding peace, to uh, bridging dialogue, um, and to find a way for us in this tiny little space in the universe that we occupy to uh, to be at peace and in conversation with each other, um, you've devoted your life to that. And to and and to those of us who were privileged enough to have listened to uh, Ambassador Rao um, over the last couple of years, from time to time. Um, sing, we also know that she has this deep commitment to music. And it's a commitment to music that doesn't just come as a listener or a uh, somewhat distant participant, but someone who actually enjoys being and performing in music. So I find it so fascinating that you've brought these two facets of yourself together to create this uh, South Asian Symphony Orchestra that will hopefully we hope and we believe will bring peace to the region. So I would love for you to comment on your inspirations, um, although we've already heard in the film, but yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Indira, for being a part of this uh, discussion today and Janvi. It means a lot to have you here on the stage here after we've watched the film. Well, you asked me about how this all came about. And uh, we, I think we would all agree that diplomacy is fundamentally about making peace and rising above war. And that has been the millennial definition of diplomacy literally through the ages. Very often, perhaps, we have not succeeded and uh, we continue to live in a world that is extremely polarized and driven by conflict and division. But I think the hope that rests in every human heart to rise above all this, and as you said, to build bridges and to bring people together, never really is snuffed out. And that is the origin of this idea to create a symphony orchestra. I know that orchestras are not bodies or institutions that you see very often in our part of the world. Although we, we live by music, music is very much the soundtrack of our lives. We have such a rich tradition given our civilizational ethos and um, the folk traditions, um, the many uh, languages in which our music is expressed and also the entertainment industry uh, that we just referred to and the music that has flowed out of this that has indeed influenced every part of the world. One only has to go back to the Oscar Awards last year and uh, the, the accolades showered upon RRR and Natu Natu. So cultural diplomacy is a part of diplomacy everywhere. And uh, today the code word is as much as we speak of hard power and military power and economic power, we also think about the soft power of a nation, the soft power of a nation's diplomacy. And uh, that is one of the very profound and rich resources that India has always possessed. And something by which we are recognized all over the world. Think of yoga diplomacy today. Think of Bollywood, uh, which is essentially a household name in every part of the world. Mm -hmm. So I tried to bring all these experiences together, having uh, been a diplomat from a very young age. It was the only profession that I ever knew. But I knew through my experience that the power that we could as a diverse and pluralistic nation, the world's largest democracy, bring to every stage across the world was this power of our soft power. And, uh, and then I thought about our region, our immediate region of South Asia. 
India is at the heart of South Asia. We are at the core of South Asia. But we are surrounded by our neighbors, all of them connected to us in a very organic way, even if sometimes politics intervenes and there are dissensions and differences of opinion. But ultimately, the force of gravity unites us all together. And it's often been said that South Asia is meant to be an integer. Uh, it's meant to be together. It isn't very often expressed that way. We need much more integration, much more connection, much more connectivity. And that is really what the orchestra tries to do. The orchestra, as Daniel Barenboim once said, is a model of what society should be. Society where we as human beings work shoulder to shoulder. We sit, we share desks together, just as we do in school. You know, you, we all go back to our school days and think of the person who sat next to us, our fellow pupil, who shared a desk with us. And that indelible memory that stays with us through life, um, for us, signifies the friendships that we made, the understandings that we forged. And so too in an orchestra, when musicians sit by, side by side and create harmony. And the sum is always greater than all the parts in it. And that really is the meaning of an orchestra. And I felt we can do that in South Asia. In the Middle East, which, as we know, is driven by so much conflict, we all know of the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza today, for instance. But the East Western Divan Orchestra was an orchestra of Israelis and Palestinians that was set up about 25 years ago. And it brought Israelis and Palestinians together to play together. And it became a world famous orchestra in the process, never mind the conflicts that still continue. So I think you have this kind of uh, uh, counterpoint that you create, a kind of alternative definition and solution that you're able to offer. And that is really what an orchestra is about. Thank you for that beautiful answer. And thank you for um, setting in context, in a sense, why a symphony orchestra as well, and how profoundly meaningful that is. Uh, Janvi, if I can sort of continue just in uh, my thoughts for just a second or two. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that that I've been doing, that I did recently, was um, to uh, put together a volume on the International Music and Art Society, along with uh, Urmila Devi, who's here, and other people, to bring together a book about um, bringing music to Bangalore. And one of the musicians who performed there was um, Smitislav Rostropovich, who again was, uh, as a, was a profound uh, cellist, a fantastic musician, but one of his deep um, guiding principles, I might say, was to bring peace through music. So um, one of the stories we learned when I was doing the research for the book, I mean, I already knew this, but we found out more uh, specifically, was um, that when the Berlin wall fell in uh, uh, 1989. Um, uh, this was just a year after he had been in Bangalore for the IMAS. He, two days later, he went to Checkpoint Charlie, which many of you might recall was the place which was the, were the gate between the East and the West. And he just grabbed a, a chair from one of the security guards, sat down, and played uh, Bach cello suites. Um, I believe just the first one. And um, and that was such a sort of profound moment, I think, in um, identifying that music really is a place for, for peace to be thought about profoundly. And so I was um, looking back at my research, and I realized that there are a number of musicians who have actually commented on them, uh, on how uh, music is something that brings peace to, the, should bring peace to the world. I think Leonard Bernstein has said something about how uh, there's violence in the world, and we will counter it with uh, 
with music. Uh, Yoko Ono talks about how uh, music is the uh, way, art and music are the ways to bring peace to the world. And I think Menuhin has a long um, quotation. All these are attributed to people. I haven't frankly gone in and looked at the original sources, but uh, attributed to him is this comment uh, about how music really, different aspects of music, including harmony, uh, are what um, bring a kind of integration to the world. And um, and then I was, I, it brought to mind this uh, beautiful uh, line from this wonderful uh, musician called Nick Lowe. Um, and he says, if I'm searching for the harmony, um, then you raise your hand in the face of uh, the cynicism of the world and you say, what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? And, um, and I, and I realized there are a number of musicians who felt profoundly about peace and about music. But I think what you and Mr. Rao have done is really taken that idea and that concept and that feeling to, to make it happen, you see. And I think that that going from concept and thought to execution is a very big step. And I know that it must be, I mean, you already alluded to Mr. Rao in the uh, film uh, that you know you have to look for funding, you have to organize all of this, and you have to, but, and I can't even imagine for any of us who've curated anything, even a single event, you know, you know how demanding every detail is. So I mean, my huge kudos to you to bringing a huge number of musicians, each certainly with their own problems uh, and uh, complications, together for this project. And I just uh, would like you to comment on aspects of that. That. <laughs> that. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for coming and watching the documentary, which I think Maya did a great job. Yes, actually it is... Uh, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of profundity and serious talk has preceded this, and I'm a little uncomfortable in such uh, atmosphere. So let me tell you how it... One of the things that I really worry about is the, is the morning when my wife gets up and says, you know, I've had this dream all my life, and I know that it is going to be serious stuff. And this was five or six years ago, and she said, you know, I've been dreaming of this orchestra all my life. And so that could be the genesis of what was to come. But the other day, more seriously, I was watching something on the Singapore uh, State Orchestra. And you know, the paraphernalia, the kind of establishment that they have to run the, of course, it's a fully professional organization. They have programs regularly. But you know, there is a CEO, there's a CEO, there's a board. There's a chairman of the board, and uh, it is serious business. So to, uh, you know, while uh, it may sound that we had uh, one concert a year, the amount of work that went into getting it together is just uh, extraordinary. And uh, once again, I think I must mention here that the extraordinary uh, computer and IT related capabilities of my wife, I think, took care of most of what uh, Singapore was, has been struggling with. But that said, yes, it's a very expensive uh, exercise. Most of our musicians, by the way, do it for the love of music. And uh, it's not that... Uh, the cost to the musicians or the honorarium being paid to them is what um, sort of impacts the budget for the concert. It is international travel, which is hugely expensive and it's getting more and more expensive every um, day, literally. It is accommodation in uh, wherever they are. As a matter of fact, it would make economic sense to have them perform not just in one place, like we had them in Bombay, almost 70, 75 people were there. Logically, at the, you know, at a marginal increase in cost, they could have gone to some other place. But even that shift, traveling from, say, Bombay to Delhi and then finding accommodation can be very expensive. So 
So far, most of the funding has come from whatever savings we had. Of course, there have been some very generous donors. We have, uh, in Chennai, we had a local sponsor who took up, a, I mean, was so taken by the idea of this South Asian concert that he said, I would like to support it as much as we want. Deepak is here, who, Deepak Kaushik, is, I, think, I think I saw him earlier in the day. He supported the film, in fact. He, uh, got to know the idea, liked the idea when he met uh, Nirupama and uh, so there have been some donors, I'm not saying that, uh, but finding support for uh, initiative that is looking at essentially Western classical music is tough, but you know, somebody woke up one morning and said she's seen a dream. Uh, <laughs> Add, uh, more than just the funding, I wanted to underline and underscore one fact that um, the very uh, existence of this foundation and the symphony orchestra uh, is uh, accounted for by the generosity of uh, Indians, our Indian friends. This has been an entirely India-funded initiative and it tells you how much of openness uh, to ideas like this there is in our country and I think that makes me tremendously proud of what we stand for. Oh, that is a very important uh, sort of a piece of information, really, because I think uh, being at the center of South Asia, as you said, uh, one does feel a kind of uh, pervasive interest in the entire region. It's part of our uh, part of our geography, really. Exactly. As the biggest country in the region, I think we have a certain uh, responsibility, perhaps obligation is not the correct word, but a certain responsibility and a certain sense of, uh, uh, you know, being bound to include uh, within this ambit of expression all our neighbors too. So I, I thought I'd sort of begin by a few responses that I had to the film and the fact that the orchestra even exists. And uh, it is interesting because in India and Indians have responded differently to say China, to Western music and even the orchestra as a format. I mean, the, the number of musicians one sees in China who have taken to uh, Western classical music is, is quite incredible. It's, it's in every school, it's, uh, it's there. And we've responded differently. We've kind of absorbed instruments into our own repertoire. We've kind of um, sort of settled around the edges of it, but not quite grabbed it. And that, is recent, that has recently begun to change. I mean, the, the, and, and I had to note it down because I was going to forget. The Symphony Orchestra of India, uh, which started out at the NCPA, for example, and, and has been doing concerts around the world. So, so it's beginning, and it's beginning in a good way. What I was totally startled to find out, and maybe everyone here knows, but for me it was new, was that a majority of the performers in, the, in that orchestra are, are Kazakh, yep. and including one of the uh, conductors. <laughs> and so that was you know, very, very interesting to note. When one kind of listens to them speak, it, it uh, you know, we saw the young Afghani boy in the film. I mean, I, I, it did bring um, one tear to my eye, because that's when you're reminded of the profound things that you were talking about, which is, you know, I, it is attributed to Nietzsche. I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look it up. But he said, we have art so that we don't die of truth. And I think that kind of comes through. And, and the, the people who are showing up in order to perform in these orchestras also has a story to tell. And, you know, I mean, you were, uh, uh, Ambassador Rao, you were earlier just this afternoon talking about a museum of migration. I mean, this would be also a story to tell because even if it's not about an orchestra or orchestras now, um, it's also, uh, it's a story of music nonetheless and music of India and music on the subcontinent. So I wanted to say a, a couple of words also to what is specific to the enterprise that you've taken, and it is unique, and it is unique for, for one reason. We've known music diplomacy. I mean, the, the United States launched its, uh, uh, you know, which you will, of course, know in September, the Global Music Diplomacy Initiative just last year. Right. Uh, Tony Blinken exactly. had performed, <laughs> Bo performed <laughs> Boogie Woogie. <laughs> Exactly. And uh, a phenomenon during the Cold War that has been bundled 
by the French as coca colonization of Europe, for example. So a lot of jazz musicians from the United States traveled to countries like Germany, like France, so Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, um, going to- Also to uh, India. Including India, of course, but Cold War diplomacy, right? Like you're sending it not only as soft diplomacy, but, but where, uh, your own soldiers are stationed, for example. So this has a history. So state-led music diplomacy has a history. Initiatives, orchestra-like and orchestra initiatives from the subcontinent, which nestle at the boundary of Western classical music and bringing in an interpretation from our music, we've seen the incredible such a orchestra from Lahore. Um, and the, the one... Um, performance which I keep playing on loop when I'm trying to write, which is the take five, uh, which just incredible. I'm sure many of you have already heard it. So that has existed and we've seen this happen. But what's unique about your effort to my eyes is that this is an orchestra of the people, as you said, by the people and for the people. It's cultural diplomacy uh, from the ground up or, or as, as, they, uh, as I've come to identify and I really empathize um, with what both of you said, you know, about um, what it takes to bring something like this together. And that's why the format, in a way, matters, because um, it's the Barack Obama funding, uh, um, uh, how do you call it? Structure, right? It's micro-funding. You, you take from each what they can give, in a sense, and you build it, and that, that includes both the music, but also the funding, and then you kind of build it, because your, your goal is not backed by the grandiose uh, the grandiosity or the, the magnificence of a state, but it's actually the, the, uh, the desires of a people to find peace and to find, you know, the, well, to, to yeah, to, yeah the, I think that the face of the, the young Afghani man will not leave me for a long time. And I, I uh, you know, to end with, and the la this is the last point I wanted to make about, about uh, soft diplomacy from India people's diplomacy from India, I mean, in a sense, you know, um, has taken various forms at various times. Some of it has been state-led, some of it has been sort of subverted, even if it was state-led. And that can be traced back actually even to the exhibitions, right, where our Indian artisans went and actually sort of, you know, brought the world of Indian artisan, um, art, art, arts and crafts to the world during the exhibition, starting in the middle, well, middle decades of the 19th century, to the festivals of India, which became quite a thing. I mean, if you go, you know, you go to Russia, you go to, uh, you go to the Middle East, you go to, um, you know, parts of Africa, and people, people know the songs. People, it's just sort of, you know, and they've seen people perform. And of course, Bollywood, which you already spoke about. So, in a way, Punching above our weight in, I mean, you know, and this is, uh, this is not something, um, uh, an unqualified uh, person who has nothing to do with diplomacy should say in the presence of an eminent <laughs> diplomat and a secretary, but punching above our weight has been something we've done since 1946-47. And in a way, finding a citizen's voice to be able to do it with a deceptively small goal of finding peace in the region is, um, it's actually very heartening at this moment, especially given um, given one doesn't quite know where to fit this, right? Like there is there is no um, like the the discurs. You know, if I was if I was speaking to an academic or the audience, I would say the discursive space, all right? Like in the, the the space in our public discourse for where to actually add this is shrinking, and so to. To place it there, and, 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 and but not worrying about that, and actually going ahead and doing it anyway, is what sort of you know will stay with me from having seen this film. So thank you very much both for the orchestra, but also for you know uh, the film Maya, so that you know we all actually will know of it, even if we haven't yet seen the concerts. Which means we will next go to the concerts now. And I think it's been a great pleasure to work with Maya and her team. Uh, you know, we went back and forth. Uh, she has uh, biblical patience in dealing with people like me who are constantly asking for changes here and there. Well, thank you, Maya. A very big shout out to you for, for all that you did. And I, a little, I'd just like to say a word. You know, normally symphonies are associated with Western classical music. Uh, around the world. And you spoke of how in China, you know, uh, children 
learn classical, Western classical. In fact, when you go to the West and they refer to music and they talk about classical music, it's actually Western classical music, but they think it applies to the whole world. But that is not the case as we know, uh, because we come from a very rich tradition of classical music. So the idea of beginning our concerts with Maitri Mbhajata was for two reasons. One, of course, to showcase our own tradition. And secondly, the message of that song, uh, Maitri Mbhajata is about cultivating friendship among nations and to me it kind of encapsulated ex the exact message of what this orchestra is about. Uh, when you speak about generosity, when you speak about self-restraint, when you speak about compassion, uh, you know, those are the qualities you would like to see uh, more accepted around the world today. Uh, and India to my mind, has really signified that spirit uh, through through the years. Never mind, you know, the ups and downs that we may have faced through our history. But ultimately, the idea of India, I think, really expresses that. So this symphony, in many ways, tries to express that idea. And, and bringing together members of the diaspora, we spoke about migration. Most of the members of the orchestra are essentially uh, people whose forefathers uh, went from India to different parts of the world. And of course, Indians, uh, you know, people who live, uh, basically young people who live in this country today. And the idea was to afford a kind of exposure for our young musicians here in this country to musicians abroad, professional musicians, the best talent, so as to invigorate the musical space. And to my mind, the, uh, you know, Rabindranath Tagore spoke about open-mindedness, about keeping our windows open to influences across the world. And I feel that however strong our cultural traditions are and our civilizational ethos uh, is, we've spoken about the world as one family. The Prime Minister speaks about Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And essentially bringing all influences from across the world to our doors also, to be able to not only uh, address them with confidence and self-conviction, but also to be able to absorb the best that comes to us from the outside. Mm -hmm. So I felt the orchestra not only brings the world to us, but it also brings India and South Asia to the rest of the world. And which is why we have started a big project, a very ambitious project. My husband will talk about it as another dream, crazy dream of mine. But to orchestrate music from India, to be able to play it in a symphony for the rest of the world, which is why we want film music from India from all uh, re uh, regional languages also, not just Bollywood. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard Nitte Nitte, that song, which is a Telugu song, actually. We'd like to bring that kind of music to the rest of the world. Uh, we played Roja, um, the Kadal Rojave, in, you know, the, the cry of the rose, as it's called in, in English. And, we, and the story of how we found that orchestration is itself uh, like an Agatha Christie novel. You know, when we started out, I didn't have, a, you know, we talk of data points today and, um, you know, the data collection that everything is dependent on in this world. We didn't have any data about musicians when we started the orchestra. We had a few Indian musicians here, but who really didn't play in orchestras professionally. We had violinists, we had pianists, we had uh, viola players, uh, we had a few trumpet players and brass players from military bands. And in fact, in our first concert, we had uh, musicians from the Indian Navy taking part. And uh, uh, so too in the uh, uh, in in another concert. But really speaking, brass instruments. I, by that I mean trombones, trumpets, horns. Uh, we have very few in India who who play in symphony orchestras, who play at that level. You know, uh, we have the military bands, but the military bands don't get to practice all that much because they are put on many other duties. Mm -hmm. So there is really not that much of a resource availability 
uh, for many of the musicians in those bands to be able to play with foreign musicians mm -hmm. and hone their skills. Uh, so building up a repertoire of brass musicians, mus musicians in the brass instruments, in uh, clarinets, in, you know, we have the Indian, in, for Indian music, we do have yes. these, uh, these kind of capabilities, but not for symphonic music. So the idea is ultimately to create, to have workshops and lessons for our musicians here uh, to, to really acquire that international level mm -hmm. that we need. Because ultimately, I think India, India's trajectory is to be more integrated with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we play a game like cricket. It's mm -hmm. a Western game, mm -hmm. but we've made it ours. Yeah. So why can't we make an institution like a symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. an Indian institution, mm -hmm. where we have the best musicians in the world mm -hmm. who can equal, you know, the best anywhere. A Lan Lan, for instance. Why can't we have an Indian Lan Lan? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think if we are not inspired to do that and um, do not push for that, uh, we've done it in so many other fields, like in, in science, for example, or uh, and so and in sport, as you say, so in music. And, uh, and I think it's also very interesting, yes, that you bring in Indian instruments into the symphony, as you showed in the film, uh, and uh, the Basuri and the uh, other, the other uh, Afghan Lithuanians and the Santur-like instruments. Um, that in itself is a kind of such a fascinating integration as well. Uh, so yes, I th thank you. Mr. Sudhakar Rao, I think um, every woman dreams of a husband who listens to his <laughs> wife's <laughs> dreams <laughs> and acts upon them. <laughs> Actually, I'm a very keen follower of Hindustani classical music and uh, different genres of Hindustani classical music. But, I mean, I'm just saying this to those who may be uninitiated in Western classical music. Listening to a good symphony play is absolutely magical. And if you have not started doing that, I think you must really start it. You get enough of that on YouTube. Just start playing some of the well-known uh, composers and it's just magic mm -hmm. and that sort of transcended to our um, sort of very modest levels too in the sense we had 50 or 60 musicians come in from all over the world who never knew each other they each had a small role to play in a larger ensemble or a larger puzzle which sort of comes together and to watch them in four or five days time to you know each play does his part or her part to excellence and the conductor brings them together and when it all comes together it's a different kind of feeling altogether. So while uh, agreeing that all genres of music need to be promoted, listened to, I think Western classical music in the country has been, uh, you know, like there are 300 uh, symphony orchestras in China and more. Uh, we perhaps have just a couple. Of course, it's slowly the interest is increasing and I'm finding that at a smaller level, at the micro level, now more and more people are taking to it. But it is something that those who are yet uninitiated should take to and make it a hobby listening to Western classical music. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I think we often tend to be overawed uh, by uh, Western expressions like this, Western yes. classical music, for instance. But you know, once you begin to listen to it mm. and understand it a little more, you, you realize that yes. it really belongs to one uh, human uh, inheritance that we all share. Absolutely. And I think it's not that alien to us in my, uh, the old Mysore state in Karnataka, certainly, because uh, the palace, the, the Mysore palace and the Maharaja himself and uh, Rani Vijaya Devi, they were great uh, concert pianists and uh, great musicians. And uh, there was a tradition of supporting Western music and perhaps not orchestras in India, but the Maharaja was well known for supporting uh, the Philharmonia in London and uh, so there is a tradition
tradition of that music as well in India. So in, it's certainly in our region and others as well. So I think it's a... If it's I may a, just it, add to that. Yes. Um, so it was a revelation to a Swiss, dear, very, very dear Swiss colleague of mine to find out that Richard Strauss was supported by the Maharaja of Mysore at some point financially. Look at my book. <laughs> Sure, um, and uh, those, and he's a biographer of Richard Strauss, and so you know he was he. So that's how I found out uh, from him. Um, you know, so my, my uh, I made a, I have made extremely feeble attempts in my life to learn music, and my teacher uh, at that point was Neela Bhagwat in Bombay, and she once said to me in Marathi, which I I don't I should probably say it in Marathi first and then translate it to English. She said she said to me, Sangeetatna jog bhakta alo pahije. So effectively what she meant, what she said was, you can and should be able to see the world in music. And I think that, that what uh, uh, Mr. Rao just asked us to do, to listen to music that we are not initiated to, opens a new world to us because that's what, you know, that's the capacity that music and language holds, right? Like so a new language and new kind of music. Uh, I mean, if, if you wanted to talk neuroscience, It'll make it'll fire new neurons and make new connections in your brain, right? Like, and it's 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 an incredible experience. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for that, Jangvi. I <coughs> yes, yes, exactly. I was going to say. Shall we open up to questions now? Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? Oh, my co my question is. Uh, prompted by something you said, uh, Mr. Rao, uh, it was about um, inspiring people or, or encouraging people to listen to Western classical music or different kinds of music. I was recently at a concert in, um, in Switzerland, of a fantastic uh, classical uh, chamber orchestra concert, and um, I was surprised at the end of the concert uh, and leaving to find that I represented the young generation that was present. And I wonder, I, I, one thing that really struck me in the orchestra when I saw it playing in Bangalore and then on the film is the number of younger people in the orchestra and how important it is in, in getting people to appreciate uh, Western classical music is to get a younger audience. And I wonder how you do that or how you uh, approach that. Exactly being high on my priority at the moment. But, uh, you know, a lot of um, schools are coming up. For example, in Bangalore now, there are a large number of uh, music schools. Essentially, in the, I mean, we had Hindustani and Carnatic music schools in the past too, but these are essentially catering to uh, Western uh, music, Western classical music, jazz and other genres, relating to instruments that are part of the, a typical uh, Western orchestra, and that's really gaining in uh, popularity. The, I really won't be able to comment on how one could create interest uh, except to sort of, I think one of the major uh, impediments or disadvantages has been that we haven't had enough of uh, Western classical music or opera uh, music or uh, orchestra playing. So when it is not there, I mean, you need, that one, there, it's a supply side issue. I mean, there is a latent demand, I suspect but there hasn't been any supply. So we create supply, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest generated, even with the younger generation. I, and that is happening. I mean, that's happening. Bombay is very active in this matter. Calcutta also, to some extent, Delhi, and mm -hmm. Bangalore now slowly. Chennai has its own, uh, I mean, not so much Western, but it, uh, they're sort of very, very attuned to following their musical uh, interests. So hopefully music shall prevail uh, sooner than later. In fact, there's a I great deal of interest among our youngsters in learning um, uh, Western classical music. I know of one instance, a member of the orchestra, a young girl who comes from a lineage of Carnatic violinists. And her grandfather, her, uh, her father, uh, they were, they've all been in Carnatic violin. Mm -hmm. And she is now, she got a scholarship to study at the Menuhin Academy in Switzerland oh. and is now at the 
Royal College of Music in London uh-huh. and learning we- Western violin. So I think they make the transition quite smoothly uh, because uh, we come from such a rich tradition, you see. So musicality yes. is so inherent to us. Yes. And I think the other, if I may sort of leap in, I think the other way in which you are making it accessible is uh, also the fact that you don't confine yourself to Western composers alone. You are playing, uh, well, uh, Vaishnava Janato and other uh, Indian uh, music that is accessible and that we hear, you know, that we hear all the time. So it's not like we are always having to work towards learning a new type of music. You, there's a question. Yeah, I'm Vivek Zawli from Bangalore. I want to respond to that Indian genre of Western classics. North of Bangalore, a small village, Mudden Hali, after the airport, there is the campus of the Human Values University by Sri Madhusudan Sai. And they have a music school, which is kind of a miracle. They have handpicked village children who have never seen these instruments. And six to eight months, most of these children have become ex- excellent in their pieces. And the symphony is called as the Sai Symphony Orchestra. And if you go to the YouTube and type Sai Symphony Orchestra, you'll be surprised how this miracle unravels. And there are reams and reams of their plays. I have gone and attended some of their orchestra uh, performances. And I'm deeply impressed. And I can tell you that these guys are going to reach somewhere. And this interest in the symphony orchestra in Indian youth is definitely spreading. But that's a startling example in the city of Bangalore. Thank you for that. I am Dr. Nagesh. I think with the new education policy of our government, a lot of flexibility is allowed in choosing the subjects. What was earlier only compartmentalized science, arts, and now it is a lot of flexibility is there. I am sure that the younger generation will be able to bring in science, culture, and art and music, and we certainly have a ray of hope with a new policy and only to be implemented, we need to have a good number of teachers who are also dedicated and trained to do the job. I'm glad you are hopeful, sir. (laughs) I think ultimately what counts is this passion for perfection. Uh, We should aim for the highest standards possible. If we're doing a symphony orchestra, we should aim. It's going to take time. It'll take 15 to 20 years perhaps for us to attain that level, but aim for the best. Don't stop with the second best. Thank you, Ambassador Rahi. Excuse my ignorance, just to extend what Sir said in terms of uh, promoting Western classical music in schools and colleges. Uh, Is it the presence of the language of music in the form of notes that seem to be predominant in Western classical music as opposed to Indian music, which is mainly from guru to shishya? You think that's a handicap in terms of, or a drawback, not a handicap, drawback in terms of taking it to the young children? (laughs) Well, I'll uh, respond with sort of a not exactly an answer, but uh, when my children were young, they learned to Western classical music in school as a sort of something that came to them. And suddenly they were speaking a secret language. They had a secret script between them that I couldn't understand and I couldn't read, you know. But the speed at which they picked it up and the um, ease at which they crossed over, I think was um, was kind of impressive, actually. So I think for a younger musician entering the world, I mean, I have a great respect for the Guru Shishya uh, tradition of uh, learning, because I think you're so immersed and steeped then in a form of music in a way that's quite um, unique, actually. Um, so if one thinks of it in, in, in its positive senses, I think that that is very profound. Please. I think the Guru Guru Shishya tradition, as Indira said, is extremely important and intrinsic, I think, to the way we've learned music for generations in this country. But in a sense, the Guru Shishya tradition prevails in the Western context also, because a lot of uh, talented musicians, when you talk to them, they say, we learned 
with so-and-so. We learned conducting with this conductor. That's we right. learned the violin from this maestro. Yes. You know, they call them maestros. Yes. It's basically gurus, yes. really. That's right. So I think there is that. And also about musical notation and learning to read music. It's like learning a language. And anybody, any, and you mentioned our own children, learn it so easily. With Western music, I think the, you know, in Indian music, the melodic line is very, very important. In Western music, you also have the rhythmic line. You have to, you have to be comfortable with both these. And uh, in Indian music, there's more room for improvisation, especially in our classical music, in Hindustani music particularly. And for, for that, it's in a way replicated in jazz. You can improvise. But in Western classical music, the room for for improvisation is is limited and everything is so strict the discipline is so very rigorous in western classical music but there's an interesting thing about vocal western music which to my mind resembles our yogic practices a lot because it's all about breathing western vocal music is all about breathing breathing from the diaphragm uh, not using just your throat or chest to be able to control your breath and where you release the breath when you sing, uh, the experts will fault you, you know, for it if you release the breath at the wrong place. So these are techniques that I think are are interesting about Western vocal music. Yes, and certainly one can imagine a confluence between the two or a self-influence. Um, I mean, I just wanted to respond very quickly with this, uh, r listening to an interview of Menuhin, whom we, you know, uh, used to live quite close to when we lived in Switzerland, and so I had a particular interest apart from everything else. Um, and he uh, talks about how, as a child, it was like a Guru Shishya Parampara. He would uh, get up in the morning at three three o'clock, practice, go to his, uh, uh, to his uh, maestro teacher, Ionesco, I believe, and, uh, and train for, you know, so many hours, practice for so many. So it is a very serious immersion too when you b wish to be a, uh, a professional musician. Um, yes. I try, try recapitulating focused attempt to bring in even countries together to a project. I remember the Hungary, pro Hungary project, uh, of, that is a food uh, project by the UNICEF, which brought in the international musicians to sing the song, uh, uh, You Are the World, uh, We Are the World. And that became so famous for years together. And uh, political leaders of various countries like Zambia and Zimbabwe, they all came together and there was a, an attempt for green revolution in those countries uh, to solve the problem of uh, hunger. So this is, the, this is the ultimate that music and such concerted efforts of national leaders and countries can take us to that. And peace is yet an important issue in the same way. That's what I wanted to recapture. Thank you. Uh, that South Asia is an, is an integer, you know, because uh, I run, as you know, a, a literary magazine for literature from the South Asian subcontinent. And one of the questions I asked myself was, what was our commonality? And I don't know if I have the answer, but it's just that you have a volume of work that responds to um, common issues, concerns, uh, problems, their ways of um, conversing with each other. And, um, and I think without art, really, uh, there is no conversation, you know, <laughs> and so, yeah. And just today, in fact, I came across uh, this quotation about an orchestra. Perhaps we could, uh, with your permission, end on that note. Uh, it says, a symphony orchestra today costs less than a football player. <laughs> You know, uh, what legacy do we hope to leave for our children, is the question. Culture does not exist to make profit, but to educate. If this does not change, in future generations, shallow and very dangerous people will prevail. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. This was really a beautiful conversation, but most importantly, such an important and profound uh, 
enterprise that the two of you have embarked upon, and um, our hearts are with you. <laughs> our souls, I should say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janvi and uh, Indira. Thank you, and Maya. Thank, Thank you, you once again. Yes. Thank you. We briefly touched upon the history of Mysore, the Maharaja's contribution to Western music. Um, can I take the liberty of saying that one of our esteemed guests in the audience, Mr. Raja Chandra Aras, is here? And I take this opportunity for him to speak a few words on how the Maharaja patronized Western music and how he took it to the rest of the world. I think this, a few words, Mr. Raja Chandraras, from you. Good evening. This started way back in 1939 when he went on a European tour along with his parents. And uh, one of the Earliest, uh, his ambition was to become a musical conductor. And he went to Switzerland and uh, in Zuri, in uh, Luzern, he met uh, Rashminif. And uh, Rashminif took him as a student, but unfortunately, as the war broke out, uh, he couldn't uh, fulfill his wishes. And he landed up becoming a king because soon thereafter, uh, both his uh, father and uncle died. But nevertheless, uh, he continued, he happened to be, you know, uh, hear the music of a Russian composer known as uh, Metna, Nicholas Metna. And he was so fascinated by his music, so he told his uh, uh, trade commissioner in London to search for him, Binstead. And he ultimately was able to form a what is known as a Metner Society in 1948 and produced the entire composition of Metner. And if today a composer like Nicholas Metner is there, people know about him, it is because of the extraordinary efforts of the Maharaja of Mysore at that point of time. <laughs> what is known as, as she said, the Philharmonia Orchestra in London, and uh, which he funded, he promised to fund every year 10,000 pounds for that. And inc incidentally, every year there used to be a series of concerts which were named as Mysore concerts. And it had virtually anybody, because you have to see it was a war torn uh, Europe at that point of time, and music was the last thing being promoted by anybody. And today, when you know that the Philharmonia concert has been patronized by none other than the King of England, UK, you can understand how far ahead the Maharaja was. And uh, similarly, as the lady said, when uh, Richard Strauss wanted his last, uh, the four seasons to be, uh, he had a dream that, you know, uh, that such and such a musician should play the this thing and all that. Sitting here in, in Mysore, he funded the entire thing, and the entire the, uh, the entire thing was recorded and live. Uh, and so that was his kind of this thing. But soon thereafter, but uh, because of the uh, Mysore becoming the part of the republic, he couldn't fund his ambitious uh, programs across the world. So. But by that time, the Philharmonia had, had, had enough patrons to follow, and even today Philharmonia exists. It's a proof that he, whatever he tried uh, was not in a failing by itself, and it has, he has succeeded largely. Uh, and today, if uh, Madam is able to do South this thing, and or even our uh, uh, NCPA, for which Maharaja was one of the members, was able to c continue this tradition. So I think it has not been a lost dream. So, and I, I hope in sooner or later, uh, Madam will be able to take this orchestra to other parts of the South Asia, and that would be a grand tour. I hope um, Mr. Sudhakar Rao will have enough headaches in taking that dream across. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raja Chandraras. He is the son-in-law of the late Maharaja, His Highness uh, Jai Cham Raja Wadir, the last Maharaja of Mysore. Thank you so much for being with us, and good evening to all. Oh, I loved this documentary. It was very crisp very neatly made and I couldn't take my eyes off. The artwork was quite notable, but the flow, the editing, the cinematography and the crispness 
was very notable. It is so nice to have such dreams. And Ambassador Nirupama Rao's dream of uh, bringing together a South Asian Symphony Foundation is really commendable because this helps bring cultures together, cultures of uh, various countries of South Asia. Plus, this is a gateway to the world where Western music can uh, hold the key to larger interactions across audiences all across the globe. And uh, I congratulate Ambassador Rao for her uh, initiative in starting this foundation. Yes, we do actually sort of enjoy classical music in the UK, but it's wonderful to see how transitions can happen. Um, and I think Indian classical music and Western classical music, I think looking forward, it could be a wonderful blend. And that was an amazing film, heartwarming to know that there's peace involved as well. So thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Fantastic effort by uh, Ms. Rao and Mr. Rao and organizing this. And what they have done is something stupendous. So congratulations to them. Great experience uh, to watch uh, this film and uh, Maya has, as always, has exceedingly done well. Uh, we are all fans of Maya films. We keep seeing the Maya films whenever uh, she prepares for that. And uh, in this in particular, which has a passion for music, I think has come out very well. And Nirupama and his team is doing a great job and it is brought out very well from Maya and his team. So, congrats Maya. Very nice, we enjoyed a lot. So, thank you very much for calling us and then we enjoyed a lot. A musical um, merging of uh, harmony. Um, I, should, I should appreciate Maya Madam for her wonderful con con converging of the documentary. Thank you. It was a really great event. We got to know a lot about uh, South Asian Symphony Orchestra. And it's really great that there is an initiative between a Western music and an Indian classical combined. Uh, so it get uh, it uh, also keep us connected to our roots with the development of the Western music. So yeah, it's a really great initiative and I love it. The noble ideal of a universal peace. So nicely made and the wonderful uh, Medley assembly of musicians, very nice. Uh, there was the great uh, uh, Hindustani vocalist uh, Bade Gulam Ali Khan, who once said that uh, if at all every child in India knew classical music, this country would never have been partitioned. And uh, this is a testimonial to the fact that uh, music can be a bridge across borders, a bridge across peoples, a bridge across hearts and uh, cultivate friendship in the hearts of people.